are these people? Our friend, uh, friend of the show, Keith McHenry. You know who Keith McHenry is? Food Not Bombs. Food Not Bombs. He's a co-founder. Mm -hmm. um, he's been doing this for like 40 years. And he's got a blog called Anarchist Cookbook, or The Anarchist Cook, uh, with Keith McHenry. I'm going to put that up right now. And I'm going to blow this up so you, so you can actually read it. But I wanted you to see what the site looks like. It's like an old WordPress site. And he says, it's already happening here. Santa Cruz and the theater of hypocrisy, carnage, and suffering. And now I'm going to put this into reader mode so we can actually like see it blown up. Right. And he talks about, I don't know if you've seen that movie. It could happen here way back in like the 1930s in black and white. They're talking about fear mongering about fascism and Hitler and all that. Um, vaguely. Like, I feel like I've seen something similar, but maybe not that specifically. Well, I saw this mm. story, this article in Truth Out about uh, what Gavin Newsom intends to do, and he issued some kind of an order along the lines of a Supreme Court recent decision that says that cities and municipalities have the authority to kick out homeless encampments, basically, and break them up. So now Newsom has changed his rhetoric and he's now ordering more sweeps and more encampments to be taken down. So again, what Keith writes here is that the Buzz Windrip type characters of Santa Cruz plan to read the 1935 dystopian political novel written by American author S Sinclair Lewis, a good times cover story promoting bookshop Santa Cruz's reading of it can't happen here warned that if we don't vote for the political party waging a genocide in Palestine and arming far-right Nazi groups in Ukraine, that Trump would come to power. The fascist dictator Bud, Buzz Windrip of Lewis's text. Before Buzz that, Windrip. Yep, that, well, that's literally, that's what the character's name was in It Could Happen Here. Mm -hmm. Before that, July 19th, the 418 Project, featuring Congressman Jimmy Panetta, and Mayor Fred Keeley, I visited my friends on the levee, handing out some of the last of the announcements for that for the evenings. It's already happening here. Protest. Uh, as I walked up to one group perching along the levee, I could hear two Santa Cruz police officers chatting with several tent occupants about providing pizza. Once the officers moved on, I asked about this pizza donation. They explained that, that the police claimed that they would give you pizza if you took a drug test. They weren't sure if that offer was still good if you tested positive. <laughs> let's let's test the guy who delivers it and see if it works out. Joe Schultz you know? of India Joe's met me at the Trader Joe's parking lot delivering iced tea for the 6 p.m. rally. Trader's Joe. India Joe's of Trader at the Trader Joe's parking lot. Yes. All right. We set up the table with pastries, sandwiches, and cold drinks on the River Street sidewalk. The first of those from the levy joined us for a snack. I mean, if there are people in this world that are destined and, and that are due statehood, honestly, Keith McHenry would be right up there with for for me. Would he's not? And he's and he would tell you he'd be I mean, the first to say I'd he's rather, far I'd from it. Him not. He, he'd say he'd be the first yeah, to say I'd he's like far from it. But all he to do the work. But no, my point is is what he's doing is is. He's literally just feeding the homeless and they're arresting him and fucking with his organization. He says, I saw a few people assembling outside the front door of the theater. So not wishing to waste the last of my flyers, I ambled down to share them with the people waiting to hear the congressman and mayor. A security guard dashed out of the venue and thrusting two white envelopes at me as he mumbled something about me being banned from the area. The area huh? I shared that I didn't care and continued passing out flyers until he summoned one of Santa Cruz's police officers to avoid a pre-protest arrest. I wore, I wandered off to retrieve my bullhorn, returning to blast my message to those in the band area. <laughs> it's, it's already <laughs> happening. You don't need to wait for Trump. A genocide sounds like fascism. Arming Ukraine, arm, arming Nazis in Ukraine sounds like fascism. Sleeping the homeless also sounds like fascism. 
It wasn't long before a crowd of protesters arrived, and I suggested they can move from the sidewalk and take the action directly outside the entrance to the event. Before long, several dozen people arched around the people lining up to get in. Right? I gave my bullhorn to one of the Palestinian activists and joined the group holding our Stop the Sweeps banner, defining the threat, defying the threat of arrest. And there he is, standing there. Right? Wallace Bain writes in Lookout Santa Cruz, quote, several dozen protesters armed with bullhorns, drums, and flamethrower passions ringed the theater, creating a din that the actors inside had to nearly shout over. On top of that, a few protesters found their way into the audience and at least five times interrupted the play reading with loud denunciations aimed at the panelists. Jose Vega would have been very proud, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. After the spoiled political theater ended, it was clear from their distressed-looking faces that Keeley and Panetta were desperate to flee their free speech circus. I opened these two envelopes the next morning, the next morning discovering that the 418 Project Executive Director Laura Bishop's letter that I was persona non grata, adding person not welcome until August 1st, 2034. You read that right. <laughs> a decade-long ban at 155 River Street or any event held elsewhere by the 418 Project. <laughs> the second letter also banned me from the Galleria Mall for 10 years. Come on, man. But not the mall. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, what are you going to do? You won't be able to get that shitty, sharper image tat you thought you might want. Wow. Mike. Hot Didn't... Topic's not even there, bro. It's not even worth it. Spencer Gifts? You know? <laughs> right. At least let me in the Spencers. Where else are you going to get your, your uh, fake dongs these days? Oh, yeah, that's right. The internet. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, Sinclair Lewis's mm -hmm. novel warned that Buzz Windrip was an enemy of free speech, adding an interesting twist to my pre ban letters seeking to silence the protest. <laughs> this is not too much of a surprise. The event's host, Bookshop Santa Cruz, commemorated Ban Books Month while owner Casey Coonerty Prati's husband, Coonerty, yes, really Coonerty, Michael Prati, directed the unit at Meta that silenced medical professionals who were critical of Trump's COVID policies, posts detailing the arming of far-right Azov Nazis, allegedly, by the Biden administration, not really, allegedly, but really, and the ugly truth of the genocide in Gaza. Fascism is a family affair for the Coonerty folks. Casey's brother is a former county supervisor, Ryan Coonerty, a 2012 Monterey Herald article, article titled Predictive Policing Gets Capital Boost reports that attorney Kayla Baskin and Councilman Ryan Coonerty, remember the last name, have taken Carol? the... Ex have Carol taken, Baskins? It might be Carol Baskin's father, husband, brother, someone related. Who knows? Carol Baskins. Councilman Ryan Coonerty... Uh have taken the experimental predictive policing program used by the Santa Cruz Police Department and created software that they hope to sell to law enforcement agencies around the nation. Fucking parasites. The duo, yeah. who, who founded the co-working business Next Space, ugh, say they've raised more than a million dollars so far to fund their newest venture. You mean laundering operation. You mean bullshit. Yeah. The article continues, quote, the program has gained international media attention, because they said so, and the attention of law enforcement agencies nationwide, many asking how they can get the program, because they told the paper to tell them that, that that's what was happening. Based on such requests, Zach Friend helped coordinate a meeting between Moeller and Baskin and Coonerty to discuss the idea of creating a business. Again, this was 2012, so... Baskin, 36, and Coonerty, 38. The investors who've helped fund their venture include Plantronics CEO Ken Capan uh, Canapan, former eBay executive Rob Chestnut, and Coonerty's brother-in-law Michael Prati, a vice president at Yahoo. 
There's that name again, Prodi. Predpol, yeah. predictive policing, is based on an analytics model developed by a group of researchers, including mathematician George Moeller of Santa Clara University and Jeff Brantingham at UCLA's Department of Anthropology. Again, this is from Keith McHenry, Food Not Bombs, an anarchist cook. In 2018, TheVerge.com had posted about Jeff Brantingham that he is as close as it gets to putting a face on the controversial practice of predictive policing. We talked about this last week with Whitney Webb and Palantir and Total Information Awareness and Meta and LifeLog and how this all connects with Peter Thiel and J.D. Vance and California. Over the past decade, the University of California, Los Angeles anthropology professor adapted his Pentagon-funded research in forecasting battlefield casualties in Iraq to predicting crime for American police departments, patenting his research, and founding a for-profit company called Predpol LLC. A June 2021 article, Stop LAPD Spying, sues LAPD to uncover communications with UCLA professor who founded Predpol, reports on opposition to this dystopian racist police state software started by Ryan Coonerty. So that's where it ties back, is that this Coonerty family and, and his brother-in-law. In 2019, a group of 68 UCLA professors and graduate students sent a letter to LAPD condemning Professor Brantingham's work on predictive policing technologies. And in June 2020, during pandemic and after George Floyd, over 1,400 academic mathematicians joined a public letter condemning mathematical research that contributes to racist polling. I'm sorry, to racist policing. That too. The letter singled out Professor Brantingham's work with LAPD and named Predpol's racist consequences. So they were looking for an answer and they got it because they produced it. Posted on datasmart.hks.harvard.edu in 2013, Dr. George Moeller could not have foreseen the deluge that descended upon him at Santa Clara University shortly after local police adopted his groundbreaking algorithm in July 2011, and media reported that his new software was taking criminals off the streets. He says, it may seem a stretch, but the model of post-earthquake tremblers or temblors is very similar to that of criminal activity, he said. Criminals want to replicate their successes. They go back to similar locations. They repeat their crimes. It's almost identical to how aftershocks roll out after earthquakes, following predictable fault lines and timetables. So this is how he's... Again, pre-crime is what he's talking about, predictive pre-crime. In 2010, Dr. Moeller took his seismology theory north to Santa Clara University, where he joined as assistant professor of mathematics and computer science, and married and started a family. And then serendipity struck, he met Zach Friend, a public information officer and crime analyst with the Santa Clara Police. Friend was intrigued by the potential of predictive analytics, and soon, he and Moeller were brainstorming how the latter's algorithm to track earthquake aftershocks could be adapted for police work. Dr. Moeller says, we met several times and, try and decided to try for deployment with the Santa Cruz police. I wrote the prototype software and gave it to, to the police in July 2011. It turns out Zach was a media mastermind. He'd work in the press office of the 20, 2008 Obama campaign. Once Popsi and the New New York Times picked up the story, it was off to the races. So he basically got the story planted in, in mainstream corporate media and got corporate media to perform propaganda is essentially what he's saying. So Keith, back to Keith, it was fitting that someone supporting the genocide in Gaza and the army of Azov far-right military units in Ukraine would be reading a play warning of fascism. His April 20th, 2024 post on his blog announced his support for more war as he writes, quote, the package would deliver critical support for Ukraine in its efforts to push back against Russia's unprovoked war of aggression 
safeguard Taiwan from an advancing China, and ensure the security of the nation of Israel in a volatile Middle East, unquote. Who wrote this? Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's Zach Friend, who worked with the Obama administration. He says the $95 billion yeah. national security package includes, of course, $61 billion for Ukraine, $26 billion for Israel, $8 billion to bolster defense capabilities in the Indo-Pacific, that's Taiwan, and $9 billion for global humanitarian assistance, meaning the cleanup after we destroy all these people's homes. Meanwhile, the city of Santa Cruz is getting $4 million to clear the homeless from outside the homeless shelter. Yeah. Heath sent me that earlier. Bookshop Santa Cruz is not shy about hosting war criminals. They invited a former CIA director to speak on the need to expand the war on terrorism on September 10, 2018 at, a P at Peace United Church. Expand the war on terrorism at Peace United Church. Anybody see the irony there? Several of us who protest... Several of us who protest Panetta's call for more war were banned from Bookshop Santa Cruz for life, but Casey changed her mind realizing I was helping organize an event with Chris Hedges and she'd already ordered copies of his books. Panetta has been a soldier of advancing the agenda of the Empire for decades. When he was Clinton's chief of staff, the administration's sanctions and no-fly zone killed more than 560,000 children, according to a study by the F Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. A December 12, 2011 Voice of America propaganda report noted, quote, U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta is on a surprise visit to Afghanistan, where he says 2011 will mark a turning point in the 10-year-old war, which then became a 20-year-old war. Panetta would denounce Biden's hasty evacuation 10 years later after tens of thousands of Afghans have been killed. Gross. The locally owned bookshop Santa Cruz is not the innocent free speech defender of democracy as it likes to project. Like others in Santa Cruz who seek to project a do no harm image, many are direct participants in the creation of a frightening dystopian digital panopticon complete with robotic warfare. What? An officer. Yep. Uh, yep. An officer of the anti-homeless hate group Take Back Santa Cruz is the husband of Google's general counsel, Halima Delane Prado. We received a snapshot of, the, uh, of Manuel's emails between himself, city manager Martin Bernal, Mayor Donna Myers, and Republican city council person Renee Golder, coordinating efforts to rid Santa Cruz of the homeless. In a December 18th, 2020 email, Manuel thanks Martin for the week before Zoom meeting, writing about striping Delaware, uh, where many have been, uh, yeah, have been living in vehicles um, to sleep, stepping up enforcement of all parking rules, not just the 72-hour limit, and this... Update on why such folks, such as Keith McHenry, parked on McPherson, and Alicia Cool parked on Delaware, have not been towed despite receiving so many tickets. Unquote. It's a relief to learn that their intelligence on my parking locations and ticket reality is so inept. Google is one of many companies advancing slaughter in Gaza with their Project Nimbus. This $1.2 billion joint contract between Google and Amazon signed in 2021 provides cloud computing infrastructure, AI, and other technology services to the Israeli government and its military. Isn't that nice? Yep. A staff person who attended the two-by-two -two meetings between city and county officials shared the Halima Delane Prado exchange with... Uh, County Supervisor Ryan Coonerty and Mayor Donna, Mayor Donna Myers. Myers and Coonerty talked about busing the homeless to Camp Roberts, California National Guard Base in Monterey and San Luis Obispo <sighs> counties. Isn't that nice? Facebook, of course, is another local CIA-linked member of the National Security State. 
We talked about that last week. Investigative journalist Whitney Webb's April 12, 2021 article, The Military Origins of Facebook, writes, quote, Facebook's growing role in the ever-expanding surveillance and pre-crime apparatus of the national security state demands new scrutiny of the company's origins and its products as they relate to a former controversial DARPA-run surveillance program that was essentially analogous to what is currently the world's largest social network. According to Meta's website, Ryan Coonerty's brother, Michael Prati, is the head of privacy at Facebook. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second. Wrong one. Wrong one. This one. Because it's relevant here. I put this graphic together, and what, what he's talking about and what Whitney's talking about is Facebook was originally LifeLog. We read this last week uh, during Whitney's article about Peter Thiel and his connections between all of these organizations and people. Okay, and that's mm. what Keith is talking about here, that Facebook is connected to LifeLog, which was DARPA, and the chief of privacy at Facebook is this guy's brother, Coonerty's brother-in-law, Michael Prati. That's bad. And the one who, by the way, also I think her husband or her, his wife owns this bookstore where they're hosting war criminals and... You know, uh, hosting the It Could Happen Here event or protesting it. Bad news, bad things are happening. Well, they're shit lips. Whitney wrote in mid-February that Daniel Baker, a U.S. veteran described by the media as anti-Trump, anti-government, anti-white supremacist, and anti-police, was charged by a Florida grand jury with two counts of transmitting a communication in interstate commerce containing a threat to kidnap or injure. We actually covered that Daniel Baker story here on How Do We Miss That? The communication in question had been posted by Baker on Facebook, where he had created an event page to organize an armed counter rally to one planned by Donald Trump supporters at the Florida capital of Tallahassee on January 6th. Close to your house, Reef. Yep. Quote, yep. If you are afraid to die fighting the enemy, then stay in bed and live Call all of your friends and rise up, he had written on his Facebook event page. Actually, no, we're, that was journalist Stephen Baker. That's not Daniel Baker, the activist here. This is a different story. I apologize. I got them confused. Baker's case is notable as it is one of the first pre-crime arrests based entirely on social media posts. The logical conclusion of the Trump administration's and now Biden administration's push to normalize arresting individuals for online posts to prevent violent acts before they can happen. From the increasing sophistication of U.S. intelligence and military contractor Palantir's predictive policing programs to the formal announcement of the Justice Department's disruption and early engagement program in 2019, to Biden's first budget, which contained $111 million for pursuing and managing increasing domestic terrorism caseloads, the steady advance toward pre-crime-centered war on domestic terror has been notable under every post-9-11 presidential administration. It's not ramping down, and they still haven't really attacked us at home. Yet the post-9-11 war... You know, uh, Homeland Security budget is bigger than ever, is what he's saying. Palantir was in the news the night Congressman Panetta and Mayor Keeley read It Can't Happen Here. Palantir's co-founders Joe Lonsdale and Peter Thiel announced that they would be supporting Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. Go figure! There's Peter Thiel is the puppet master behind J.D. Vance's career, from setting him up in his Mithril Capital hedge fund, his book and his movie deals, the U.S. Senate, to his rise as Trump's vice presidential running mate. The swamp is already in Trump's tent. Another Teal associate, the military contractor Elon Musk, also pledged fuck support. Twitter. Yep, fuck Twitter. Okay. Uh, the military contractor Elon Musk also pledged support for the Trump ticket, assuring the wars will continue no matter who is elected. Yeah. 
While Palantir is donating millions to Trump's campaign, they were also bragging in their ads about that their AI software was used by the FBI to nab nearly 1,000 January 6th Trump supporters. Palantir serves as a contractor to all 17 of the U.S. intelligence agencies, as well as many other U.S. federal agencies, including the Pentagon. It was largely funded into existence by the CIA's InQtel, and the CIA was Palantir's only yeah. client from 2005 until 2008, during which time the CIA was a key part of directing Palantir's product development. It was built for and around them after being spun off by DARPA. And the U.S., we, again, Whitney covered this last week. The U.S., it was so controversial. The U.S. government didn't want anything to do with it. So what did they do? They privatized it and they hired somebody else to manage it and worry about it and handle the liability. James, mm. James Bamford writes in the April 2024 issue of The Nation, quote, earlier this month, saw a continuation of that effort with the targeting of three well-marked and fully approved aid vehicles belonging to World Central Kitchen, killing their several seven occupants and ensuring that the food would never reach those dying of starvation. The targeting was precise, placing missiles dead center in the, agency, the aid agency's rooftop logos. Israel, however, said it was simply a mistake, similar to the mistaken killing of nearly 200 other aid workers in just a matter of months, more than all the other aid well, workers killed. Hmm? There's new footage for that, I think, um, that hasn't been released yet that the UK has, I do believe. Um, well, so the, I forget who put that out, but the aid workers already killed, I think, has got that story are more than all the other aid workers killed in all the wars in the rest of the world over the last 30 years combined, according to the aid worker security database. Such horrendous mistakes are hard to understand, considering the enormous amount of advanced targeting AI hardware and software provided to the, the Israeli military and spy agencies, some of it by one American company in particular, Palantir Technologies. Well, we stand with Israel, the Denver-based company said in posts on X and LinkedIn. The board of directors of Palantir will be gathering in Tel Aviv next week for its first meeting of the new year. Our work in the region has never been I mean, more vital, just, and it will continue. You, you can just replace we stand with Israel with they kneel for Israel, and that just works. As one of the mm -hmm. world's most advanced data man mining companies with ties to the CIA, Palantir's work was supplying Israel's military and intelligence agencies with advanced and powerful targeting capabilities, the precise capabilities that allowed Israel to place three drone-fired missiles into three clearly marked aid vehicles. So that's Joe Lonsdale. He's a co-founder of Palantir alongside Peter Thiel. His corporate profile says he's a technology entrepreneur and investor. He's the managing partner at 8VC, a U.S.-based venture capital firm that manages several billion dollars in committed capital. He was an early institutional investor in several technology startups, including the Santa Cruz military contractor Joby Aviation. Ryan Coonerty's investor Ken Canapan sold his Plantronics building to Joby Aviation in November 2022. The Joby Avi Aviation website noted in April 2022 that the U.S. Air Force's Agility Prime program would net more than $45 million for the Santa Cruz company. So they're also military contractors, which we knew, building on more than five years of engagement with defense agencies the expanded contract leverages Joby's years of research and technology development and will include new testing to, in, to evaluate their advanced technologies. It brings the potential value of the total contract to more than $75 million. Okay. Yes. Why does that matter with Joby Aviation? Just because he, he doesn't... Okay, he, he's an institutional investor in this company. So he owns this, and he also owns Palantir, where he's a co-founder. He also started the Cicero Institute. Yeah, to the tune of 75 mil, which is like... 
That's just on this one contract. That's just on this one contract. Right. Lonsdale also right. started the Cicero Institute, which is a policy group that delivers entrepreneurial solutions to public problems. Uh-huh. The public-private partnership that Whitney always warns about. The Cicero Institute campaigns for laws that allow private competition in government areas such as health care, housing, and education. Little cracks in the system. So what they'll do is they'll find some kind of a problem, exploit that, offer a private solution, which then commercializes it, and then fuck it up, by the way. But oh yeah, we're paying for it in the whole time. The Cicero Institute provides legislative templates to states and cities. Oh, great. His website on homelessness starts, states should ban unauthorized street camping. Quote, street camps are dangerous to the public and the vulnerable homeless alike. They are homeless. What do you mean? They are often hotbeds of violence, especially against women and children, especially those who are homeless themselves. The public widely supports enforcing ordinances against dangerous street camps and moving individuals into emergency shelters. And that's what the whole game is. He goes on to write, quote, states should amend civil commitment laws to make it easier to help those who cannot help themselves and get them out of prison. Adding, quote, many street homeless suffer from chronic and untreated mental illness for those that are a public nuisance or a danger to themselves or others, there must be a third option besides prison and abandonment. So definitely destroying their encampment home is the way to do it, right? So far, the Cicero Institute has placed 10 bills in at least eight states, including Arizona, Georgia, Kentucky, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, Tennessee, Florida, and Wisconsin. Texas became the first state to pass such a law in 2021, and Tennessee and Missouri followed in 2022. So now it is literally illegal, like, to sleep in your car, I believe. Cynthia Griffith wrote about Wisconsin's Assembly Bill 689 and Senate Bill 669 on the Invisible People website, quote, concentration camps and secret committees, out-of-state lobbyists and flat-out lies, as unbelievable and terrifying as it sounds, this is the glimpse into what's happening behind closed doors in 2024 Wisconsin. And it gets even worse. Just in case you were worried, it didn't. Kentucky GOP's new bill decriminalizes use of deadly force against the unhoused. Yep. The Cicero Institute website notes that on March 20th, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed House Bill 1365, which will make Florida a leading state in the fight against the failed homelessness policies that have wreaked, wreaked havoc on so many American citizens. And then we've got Joe Lonsdale. Again, he's co-founder of Palantir, and he's military contractor. It's been a momentous few weeks for the homeless policy in the United States, as you may know. This has been a keystone policy area for us since founding the Cicero Institute. And we've become the leading organizational voice for reform, as well as a resource for state leaders who want to take bold action. In Florida, we were, a, we were proud to work with lawmakers on a legislative package that meets the needs of state and emphasizes uh, the, um, the accountability model that we pioneered. Bullshit. Accountability. Such garbage. Joe Lonsdale had another win on April 22nd. This one's a big one. With the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Grant's Pass v. Johnson, letting localities impose criminal penalties for acts like public camping and public sleeping without violating the Eighth Amendment even if they lack sufficient available shelter space to accommodate their unhoused population. This is where it gets so bad. All right. Mm. Democratic mayors and governors pushed to have the meager protections of the Grants Pass case overturned. But yesterday's ruling by the Supreme Court provides state and local officials the definitive authority to implement and enforce policies to clear unsafe encampments from our streets is what Gavin Newsom said in a statement. This decision removes the legal ambiguities that have tied to the hands of local officials for years and limited their ability to deliver on common sense measures to protect the safety and well-being of our communities. I'm going to let you ask the big question about money in this case. Go ahead. 
I mean, where where's the money? Where's the money, Lebowski? How much have we given to homelessness wondering? to fight homelessness in this country? Somebody's Very got low. it. No, a ton. We've yeah. we've thrown billions into it, but what have we got to show for it? Is nothing. I mean, have we have we given? Have we tried just giving them homes? Have we tried? Maybe they should stop eating avocado ta- avocado toast, or maybe they should eat ramen noodles. I- Bootstraps. The bipartisan march yeah. to criminalize America's homeless doesn't need to wait for the election of Trump in advance. It is happening now in Santa Cruz. The city of Watsonville began to clear out a homeless encampment along the Pajaro River, River levee on Monday, July 22nd. It's a process that's expected to last through August 2nd. The Santa Cruz police posted eviction notices on tents throughout the Poganip, telling those who fled the sweeps at Harvey West and Coral Streets that they had to remove their belongings by 9 a.m. on July 29th. That's like coming up this morning. Jessica York writes in her April 19th, 2024 Sentinel article, quote, Santa Cruz received $4 million to address Harvey West and Coral Street homeless encampments. During the two-year life of the Encampment Resolution Fund, Granted via the state of department. Bro, imagine imagine what you can do with four million to sweep out the encampments like, and clean the streets. That's what they're doing. Right, that, but that's just what that is. No, I know that. But like imagine using that money for actually making them not homeless. Imagine. Santa Cruz would be expected imagine to assist doing something like that. Fifty five people on the streets, but the city claims they're over a thousand, and that's based on uh, what seemed an intentionally poor organized the po- organized point in time count, and we talked about counting the homeless. I think between us, it was a private conversation. I know we talked about the count uh, on this on this show once, um, where we read an article about someone One, who, uh, uh, who sorry, walked, uh, you know, who, who like walked count. around the city and tried to count homeless people in order to determine how many there were. And it was really difficult, and it was right. not an exact science by any stretch. Right. You've got a June twenty, June 4th email from CEO of Housing Matters, Phil Kramer, who thanked the mayor, city managers, um, and, and um, Housing for Health Director Robert Ratner for clearing the area around the homeless shelter of the homeless. The sidewalks are stained and reek of urine. Is it possible for city staff to do some sidewalk power washing? If you give us um, authorization, we might be able to do some of this cleaning work ourselves or hire it out. And they ended up hiring 20 employees. Right? So Mm -hmm. they're now paying people with that $4 million to clean the sidewalks. Uh, But they're also clearing out the people who live there. In a rush to remove the homeless, the rush to remove the homeless got another boost when California Governor Gavin Newsom signed Executive Order N-124 on July 24th, directing state and local officials to start removing homeless encampments, stating that the recent Supreme Court ruling in Grants Pass v. Johnson now empowers cities to enforce bans on sleeping outside in public. So yes, it is already happening here, and it is likely to get even more repressive as the news biometric IDs and programmable digital currency and AI driven world war and the intermit the internment of homeless Americans is implemented by these very same people who struggled to read. It can't happen here at the bookshop Santa Cruz event. All right. This is the notice by the way, that that's posted to vacate on the tents. He, he posted that up there. Notice to vacate. Mm. The unaccompanied items are subject to removal and may be discarded or destroyed. They want to destroy people's stuff. It's like impossible to look when you set up an encampment like that. It does. You can't just take it all down. They gave the, it's a, what they said yeah. is they gave them 10 days. They posted it on the 19th and said, by the 29th, get your stuff out. Yeah. Look, let me see the end there here. So they posted it on the 19th. If they even posted it then at all, all right, they for sponsored shelter navigation, there's a phone number for related inquiries, there's a phone number. But man, 
I mean, I, I get that California has a homelessness problem and they need to do something about it. All right, and they have to figure it out. Anna Kasparian, I'll bet, would be very happy about this whole solution. <laughs> um, yep, she supported similar, did she not? Yes. Unlike an organization that's funded by Jeffrey Katzenberg, we are funded by our users and by the people watching now, and we love you for it. Um, please, if you can, and if you can't, enjoy the show, watch the show, but support independent media because we need it more than ever to challenge the corporate crap that's out there. You can do so by any of the links there or by going to co-fee.com slash Indie News Network as well and uh, supporting your streamers and helping out for the and helping out for the indie media awards uh which is what we're going to be doing we're going to change that from new laptop for jesse um yeah it's it's so frustrating um they're not providing adequate shelter all right uh steve gee uh there are steve gee there are over 27 vacant homes per each homeless person that is correct all right um there's so much God. Wow. We're the only ones telling it like it is out here. Because corporate media sure ain't telling you what's going on with this. Okay, they're trying to bury this stuff. They're trying to hide it. They're trying to make it inconvenient and distasteful for people to even discuss. We're not going to do it, and we're not going to turn away. And we're going to keep keep spitting. 